Just ahead on American Black Journal, a special honor for the country's first African-American military pilots. We'll talk with two members of the Tuskegee Airmen about a Top Gun t competition that's making headlines 64 years later. Plus, a Detroit shelter is offering hope and freedom to refugees seeking legal asylum in the United States and Canada. That's all coming up next. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint-by-number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. They were the real Top Guns and the real Red Tails. The Tuskegee Airmen of World War II were determined young black men who enlisted in America's first African-American military aviation units. They also made history as the winners of the first Top Gun competition in 1949. However, the trophy they won in the fighter gunnery contest soon went missing, along with records from the competition. The trophy was finally discovered in 2004 in the basement of the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. This past week, a replica of the trophy was unveiled at a celebration for the Detroit chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. The Airmen also welcomed another original member to the group and presented him with the Tuskegee Airmen's coveted blue jacket. I'm pleased to welcome to American Black Journal the president of the Detroit chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, Arthur Green, along with the newest documented member of the Tuskegee Airmen, Russell Nall. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Mr. Nall, I wanna, I wanna start with you because I think this is just a remarkable story. Uh, it's been so long since uh, you did what you did during the Second World War and finally uh, you're being recognized for all of that, all of that work. Right. Yeah. Why did it take so long? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, why, what it got screwed I, after up After I got there. out of the uh, Air Force in 1946, I got out of aviation altogether, uh -huh. and up until this day. Uh huh. And so, it, was it that was it a question of finding the records to prove that that, that you were one of the original airmen? Uh, yes, uh, I f I found out uh, just recently that they had a, that they had the records. I had my own records at home, uh -huh. but they had to be confirmed. I see. Yeah, I see. So that's one of my my friend. Uh, uh, went someplace and, and got the records. Yeah, yeah. So tell me what that was like to finally I, get the blue I, jacket. I was really, uh, well, I was really surprised the other night when I got it. And uh, that was the last thing on my mind, <laughs> to get a jacket. You know? <laughs> right, right. And I saw so many of my old friends I hadn't uh, seen for 50 years. Right, yeah. right. Um, but I'm pleased now. Yeah. Yeah, so so this is a big this is a big deal. I mean, it's not it's not it's not every day or every week that you find another member of this original uh, uh, group and and are able to recognize them, right? That's right. We have several people around the country that claim to be original Tuskegee Airmen, right? And that's why we have a term we call DOTA, documented original Tuskegee Airmen. Okay. Okay. So we have to prove or check documentation to make sure that they were actually part of the experience. Right. And and how do you how do you do that? So 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 long ago. I mean it, it seems like that would be a pretty painstaking process. Well, it usually is um, but every military person should have a copy of their discharge order, their DD214. Right. And on that will show where they were stationed and different units and things. We use that along with other records. Uh, we had one gentleman that couldn't find the DD-214, but he found a birth certificate for his oldest child who was born 
at the hospital on Tuskegee Airfield. Okay. Okay. And that was one way. That's of, one of way to document to, to, to prove. Right. Right. And and it, it seems like there's this special connection between the Tuskegee Airmen and Detroit. Um, and I I know why that is, but I'm not sure everybody everybody watching will will immediately make that connection. Yeah. Well, actually, the the term Tuskegee Airmen really didn't come about until Charles Francis wrote his book and coined the term Tuskegee Airmen. Uh -huh. um, back in the early 70s, uh, one of the founders of the organization, Alexander Jefferson, as he tells the story, a bunch of friends from the, the their uh, service days got together in his basement uh -huh. and they came up with uh, the idea to have an organization, you know, form an organization it's just, which is now nationwide. Right, right. And so, I mean, it was essentially founded here. Yes, yes. it was founded here in Detroit. Right. And we also have the National Museum for Tuskegee Airmen right. here in Detroit at Historic Fort Wayne. Right, right. And and we have a number of Detroiters that everybody knows who were, were part of this. Exactly. Right? Coleman yeah. Young, right. our former mayor, was a navigator uh, and part of the the um, Tuskegee Airmen, he was a navigator on the B-25, uh -huh. and um, he was also part of the what is called the mutiny at Freeman Field. Okay, and, and, and <coughs> tell us tell us what that was about. Okay, that was um, where um, the black officers were forbidden to go into the white officers club. Right, and. They got together and they systematically went in and maybe as twos or threes to go into this club. And the base commander put out an order saying that they will not go in. And they basically defied the order because it was an unlawful order. Right, right. And that's why it, it's termed yeah. the mutiny. The, the, the mutiny. Right. The sort of early glimpse of the kind of activism that he would, uh, that Coleman Young would be involved in exactly. for, his, for his entire life. Right. Uh, Mr. Nall, I'm, I'm curious uh, uh, about the time you spent in, in, in the military. W tell me a little about what it was like to be an airman at that time uh, when there weren't other African American uh, pilots. Well, at that point in time, I was, I was really proud to have achieved what I had done, got right. my pilot, uh, my wings, and then went into uh, twin engine flying, uh -huh. flew B-25s, and that experience, I, I really enjoyed that, but I, I was a youngster, I think I was, <laughs> what, 21, something like that, uh -huh. at that point in time, and uh, I think it was in 1945, or the, the later part of 1945, that the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan, and uh, twice. And uh, it was, I'm sure it wasn't over, what, three months, maybe three months to six months, right. that the war was over. <laughs> Right, and, right. And when I got out, of, I was <clears throat> released because I didn't have enough seniority. Okay. I, I went into the Army in 1942, uh, and uh, the war ended in, what, uh, 46, I right, think. Right, right. Uh, so so um, how, did you, how did you end up becoming a pilot? I mean, was this something that you were recruited for? Did you decide this is something you were interested in? No, I was, well, at first I was in the 93rd, uh, field artillery and we went on maneuvers uh -huh. and while I was on maneuvers I met uh, some men from Tuskegee who had washed out of uh, fighter plane training okay and they were sent to Fort Huachuca to uh, observe what they call field artillery okay see and that's the way I got into it one of the fellows got a got a a bulletin from uh, one of his Tuskegee friends, and he gave it to me uh, relative to a test that would take place in Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. Uh -huh. 
So he, he suggested that I go down there and, you know, take the exam. Yeah. And that's what I did. And that's what you did. Yeah. Wow. And I ended up passing that and then got a letter a couple weeks later to the effect that uh, General Arnold wanted me to join the uh, Air Force. And that was my introduction to uh, to the right, Air Force. To the Air yeah. Force, uh -huh. right. Uh, uh, tell me why it's important um, uh, to, 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 to commemorate this the way we do now. I mean, you guys are very active in, in preserving these memories. Well, this is like a spoken history. Um, you know, a lot of people say there's a difference between history and his story. <laughs> right. So we're trying to preserve history and make sure that what these gentlemen did is passed on to future generations. Right. You know, like Tom Cruise wasn't the first Top Gun. <laughs> wasn't the first Top Gun, right? <laughs> right, right. right. You know. uh, and that's, I mean, that's one of the more interesting stories is that, uh, you know, they weren't part of this Top Gun com competition, which is a very intense fighter combat uh, right. uh, uh, just like the movie, uh, but the first winners were African Americans. Right. Yeah. And it, it you know, it's, it was amazing that, um, well, what they, they started the competition and all 12 fighter squadrons from around the United States met to compete. And um, as Colonel Stewart said, the commander was Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Uh, right. And he called, called the, the three pilots in that were going to compete. Wished them luck and told them, if you don't win, don't come back. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Set that level of uh, expectation. Right. Of excellence. Right? And that was his form of, you know, humor, but yeah. he was kind of serious was, about that's that. That's right. He's only half joking, right? Right. You got to go win and right. prove that uh, that you can do this as well as anybody else. Right. Right. And they, they were successful. Uh, how did the trophy get lost uh, for as long as it did? Um, well, the first winners of the conventional competition where it was a 332nd. Uh -huh. was uh, Alva Temple, James Harvey, and uh, Harry Stewart were the, were the three pilots. Okay. Um, there was a jet competition and conventional. And then uh, the, they were the first winners. Then the next time they held the competition, they came up with a different trophy. And the records sh showed first winners unknown. Oh, okay. And it it so. held. It stayed that way until um, I believe it was the early '80s. Okay. And um, Colonel Stewart, Harry Stewart, was uh, at one of the meetings for the Detroit chapter, and um, Lynn Isabel, who was also a member, uh -huh. had access to a magazine that actually showed who won. Who the won? had the scores and yeah. everything. Yeah. And they were able to, to bring that out through research and they got the records to reflect who the actual winners to were. To reflect the truth. To right. reflect the truth. Right. And then later, um, Miss Zelly Orr did some research and found the trophy in a Warehouse in a basement, in right? basement <laughs> warehouse in uh, Wright Patterson in yeah. Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, it's like the kind of stuff you see in movies, right? Exactly. <laughs> the trophy gets lost, but well, uh, this is a great, uh, important piece of history that you guys are, are preserving. I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad you were here. Thank you. Thank you. Just ahead on American Black Journal, a Detroit organization is helping survivors of persecution start new lives. We'll talk about the services offered by Freedom House coming up next. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people flee their native lands to escape oppression and suffering. They give up everything, families, jobs, homes, and friends. Every year, hundreds of these refugees arrive at Freedom House in Detroit, seeking legal asylum in the United States and in Canada. Freedom House provides them with shelter, food, 
medical care, English classes, job training, and many other supportive services. Here to tell us more about Freedom House is Executive Director Deborah Drennan. She's joined by a former Freedom House resident who now works as a case manager for the organization, Lucy Neighbor. Lucy is a native of Cameroon in Central West Africa. Welcome to American Black thank Journal. You Welcome so back, much. I yeah, should say. You, you are an old American Black <laughs> Journal friend, right? Yes, uh, Freedom House is one of my favorite uh, Detroit oh, institutions, you. and it's such a it's such a uh, sort of under the radar kind of place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that this is one of the few places, in fact, that that has uh, one of the few cities that has an institution like this that that welcomes people who are. Uh, fleeing their their home their, their home countries and trying to get here. That's right. In fact, we're the only one in the nation. Is that, that's right. The only that one in the United States. You know that provides all the comprehensive services for asylum seekers and now uh, victims of human trafficking. Right. Since our last visit, um, under one roof, so you can of course get services independent of um, the kind of one stop shop. Sure. And so we're really proud, very proud of that, and proud to be in Detroit. Right. You know? And you're right, we have been under the radar, um, but now with um, you know the internet and trying to keep us quiet <laughs> is just next to impossible. Right. So, right. Um, uh, and so Lucy, you're one of the the people who came to the United States through Freedom House. Tell me a little about your your journey. Oh, my journey is a journey of uh, a fight uh -huh. and uh, looking for freedom and testing for uh, justice. So uh, I I came to Freedom House in 2008 uh -huh. uh, after uh, spending a lot of nights outside in Atlanta. And then uh, I found my way in Detroit. And when I opened... Uh, when Freedom House opened the door for me, I find my healing inside and uh, the strength to go move forward. Yeah. So I stopped being a victim and I learned through uh, our partners and volunteers, a lot of people and the kindness and the love and the hard work, the dedication and the commitment of Freedom House staff then and now that I'm part of, that there's no, no place to be, to feel I mean, safe. Right, right, right. And so what was it, what was it in Cameroon that you were getting away from? The per persecution. Yeah. So. Uh, by, by the government. By the government. Yeah. And uh, by the government through the military or, you know, so they, they have their own way to oppress the population. And sometimes you cannot see it, it's not, uh, something really open or brutal like they will come to drag you in the morning when everybody or you go to court and you have the right to 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 make up your case no so they kidnap you or right then to, they came to your house at uh, at the night like uh like what animals so you have been attacked right. and your life is changed from that time and and did you just did you just flee the the, the country or did, I mean uh, what what got you to America? Yes, I uh, through some friends that uh, and the grace of one of uh, I think is she 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 is uh, a, a soldier too, so she helped me. I didn't know her. I still have a voice in my mind. Uh -huh. So some people are working with the system and maybe they, they, they don't want to or they're tired to do the bad thing. And those people exist. She helped me. I don't know how she got out everything. And through some other friend outside, I got my passport. I didn't know where to go when they asked me the first The first thing was like, yeah, United States would be good for me. Right. So I, I, I came to, uh, was a Bruxelles airplane. Okay. Yes. Wow. Wow. I mean, I you know, you listen to that story. It's it, it's hard to sort of sort of fathom how many people have that same story around right. the around the planet. This year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary, and so hundreds of thousands of people with the story have yeah. come through, and uh, have extraordinary uh, legal care. We've had the finest of lawyers and pro bono agents throughout the Detroit area, um, 
the law clinics at the universities, U of M, U of M, and Wayne State, Cooley. And this is uh, the, the legal work is to get them uh, legal status yeah, here correct. in the, in the United States. And, and very quickly, there's two types of refugees. There's a refugee that's designated outside of the country, the UNHCR, we think of the Iraqis, who are designated legal status or refugee uh, status. They right. come in and right away they re, it's called resettlement. And they're getting resettlement services, resettlement benefits. Asylum seekers aren't considered refugees till they land in our soil. Right. And so they're not entitled to the refugee settlement benefits. And so that's why the services Freedom House offers are so important. Victims of torture, persecution come into the organization, and everything we provide is through donations from the community right. and through, of course, some generous foundations and yeah. funders. So it's, it's unusual, and that's what makes it so unique and such a hard organization, quite frankly, to fund because sure. everything we use today to get ready, including the transportation to get here, right, is all provided by the organization because the asylum seeker is not eligible to earn right. an income during the process. Right, and it's and it's sort of a bridge, right? It's it's to yeah. say, uh, you're here, you've got to survive while we try to get that that right. status cleared up. The bridge up. to freedom, we call it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. The bridge to freedom. How, how frequently uh, do you find that you can't get that status? cleared up well you know it's not very common for us because it's what we do right, right? right so when you have all the comprehensive services the national average and I haven't checked it I mean so I, I'm, I'm throwing out a, an old statistic that's probably about eight nine months old but the national average of asylum at the first step through the Chicago interview which is the the region we go to is about 66 percent okay the asylum rate through Freedom House is in the mid 70s. Okay. So, so you're doing better. We're doing than... better because when somebody gets their application, we have all of the components that are necessary. So we have a volunteer physician, Dr. Vidya Ramanathan, who comes in and does all the medical affidavits for all of our residents. Okay. Pro bono. So you might be someone who's submitting your application independent and don't realize how important that medical affidavit could be. Right. We work with Access, and then they provide the, the psychosocial affidavits. Right. So, up to colic. so again, if you're in the community, you don't know those things are so important. And then other evidence that we're able to, to help through private mailing companies to get the documents. So right. when an asylum officer reviews this application, it's pretty thorough. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I, I'm wondering what your experience was like coming here to the house with the number of, one of the things that always struck me about Freedom House is the diversity of uh -huh. people there. There are people there from all over the world mm -hmm. and maybe encountering each other, uh, each other's cultures for the first time. Yeah. That, that was the first time for me to, to see a lot of people from different countries at the same time and, and living with them as a family. I mean, the experience is, is great and uh, I mean, that's the, the, the best part of Freedom House because when you have been dig down, mm -hmm. like you lose your dignity and the trust mm -hmm. and you come at Freedom House, you see some people, like it, it's not just you. So the healing starts before even you meet the psychologist because you know, oh, so I was not guilty because how come somebody from Uganda have the same struggle with like me? Right. That means there's not me, there's not the person, even a boy or a, a, a woman, but there's some people like the, the government who doesn't want you know, people to live in peace. Right. So you start processing all of this in your mind and all of you together, because you have the same struggle, you, you find the support, the love, the kindness among you, and now you have to, to learn how to, to, to compromise, because sometimes what you like or you <laughs> used to eat is right. not what you it's not with what your neighbor uh, or, yeah, or your roommate. Right. You have to share a room yeah. with someone. You have a big house. In back home, <laughs> and now you have to stay in the room. <laughs> with now somebody. you're in a room with yeah. someone. So, yeah, we, yeah we no, really, that's close we quarters. Really learn. We really learn. Right. Yeah. And you're still, you're still in the family. We've got about a minute left, but you're still part of this family now, yeah. being a. We won't yeah. let go. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm so, I'm so grateful. For me, is that yeah. uh, this is a great opportunity of giving back right. what I receive. Right. So I came, I, I was not able to look somebody in the face. And now I can look and up now. and speak. So that same hope, that's like that's you can pass can that pass on. Out now. I'm, yeah, I'm so okay. grateful. All right. And isn't uh, America to... better for it? Yeah. Well, right. Right. Next year, right. Next year, <laughs> this right. year will be she sworn will, in. Yeah. 2014 as a U.S. citizen. That's, that's outstanding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
Great work. Great to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you so much. On Tuesday, the PBS series, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, will examine the long road to civil rights in America. Host Henry Louis Gates Jr. will talk with Detroit's U.S. Court of Appeals Judge Damon J. Keith. Viewers will also get a glimpse of city, the city's Motown Museum. Here's a preview. Next time on The African Americans, a change is going to come. They were screaming and chanting, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. If we work together, we can break these barriers down. The African Americans, many rivers to cross. Be sure to tune in to The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross on Tuesday at 8 p.m. right here on Detroit Public Television. That's our program for today. For today. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's show and get your ideas for future topics. So connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint-by-number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education.